Does anybody here know what God looks like? Nobody? Because I really want to know. What does God look like? I heard a story about a Sunday school teacher who was observing her classroom of children while they were drawing pictures. And occasionally she would walk around the room to see each child's work. What are you drawing? She asked one little girl who was working diligently at her desk. And the girl replied, I'm drawing God. And then the teacher paused and said, but no one knows what God looks like. And the little girl just looked up and replied, they'll know when I'm done. <laughs> so what does God look like? Is God black? Is God white? Is God a man? Is God a woman? Is God an adult or a child? I remember the, the traditional image of God maybe from Sunday school, and this may be a very similar image to what you have had of, of what God looks like. It's kind of a, a grandfatherly type person with long flowing silvery hair and a long beard maybe dressed in this white flowing robe and, and sitting high upon a throne in the clouds. That was always been kind of the traditional image of, of, of what God looks like. Well, I'm with you. I, I don't know what God looks like either. But I believe that we're all going to be a little bit or a lot surprised when we finally see God face to face. I wonder if the Magi, or the so-called wise men as we call them from the gospel story of Matthew 2, were a little surprised to hear that God had taken the form of a tiny little baby. I wonder if that surprised them. Because when you think of God, the master of the universe, you don't Think of a helpless little child. I don't know if they were surprised or not, but what I'm more interested in, it was their response. Was their response. Listen again to how they responded to the Christ child. It says that in verse 11, it says, On coming to the house, and, and notice, by the way, a little fun fact here, Notice that it says coming to the house. So I don't know if they were finally out of the manger, out of the barn there and, and, and in a house, but it says that they came to the house. And it, and it goes on to say that they saw the child there with, with his mother Mary. And listen to how they responded. It says that they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they didn't stop there. It says that they, they gave the very best they had to give. It says that they opened their treasure, treasure chest and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So the response was that of worship. And it's kind of interesting, though. Another little fun fact I want to share with you is that do we know really how many magi there were? We talk about we three kings, you know, that, that kind of thing. We don't really know for sure. You know the reason why we say there are three? Because of the three gifts. Three gifts. Which, again, that's just church tradition. Um, nevertheless, it did not matter to the Magi that, that God was in the form of this little baby. What mattered was their response that they bow down in worship. And listen to this. What occurs in this story between the Magi and the Christ child is what is called an epiphany. You guys have heard of that word before, right? You know, it's like if you have this, you know, it's like if the light bulb goes off over your head, you get this bright idea, or you have some sort of, some sort of revelation 
about your life, you talk about how you had an epiphany. There was some kind of manifestation that took place, a revelation that took place at that moment. And that's exactly what is happening here with the Magi. There is a manifestation, there is a revelation taking place of a divine nature. They were able to look beyond the little baby and see the power and the presence of God. And that's what traditionally Epiphany is. We celebrate uh, Epiphany in, in the church. And basically all that is is the story of the Magi traveling from the east to, we think, Bethlehem to see the Christ child. And then there's a revelation that takes place, a manifestation of the divine is what takes place there. But epiphany actually means so much more than that. It's more than just a manifestation or a revelation of the divine. Okay, There's more to it. Um, I, after doing a little further research, I found that a very similar definition in a dictionary of Christian theology, yet it added something to it, that it was more than just a manifestation of the divine, but when the manifestation or the revelation of the divine occurs, it's veiled in some way. It's, it's still hidden in, in some way. And let me give you an example. Uh, over in Exodus chapter 3, it's the story of Moses as he is standing before the burning bush, right? And here is Moses uh, talking to God and God is speaking from the burning bush. So there's an epiphany that's taking place because it's of a divine revelation, and yet it's veiled behind the flames, behind the bush. So there's a revelation that takes place. It's an epiphany. Well, and of course, the same thing with the Christ child. Here is a manifestation. Here is a revelation of the divine, and yet it's hidden within a little baby. That's an epiphany. Now, now that we have that, let's take it to the next level. As would be imagined, such appearances or manifestations of the divine, it prompts a response from those who are witnesses to it. Whenever you experience an epiphany in your life of a divine nature, it's always going to prompt some kind of response from us. What was Moses' response to the burning bush? His response to that epiphany was taking himself and his elders out into the desert for a journey for three days. And while they were out there, in the desert, for those three days, they praised God. They worshiped God. They offered up sacrifices to God. So again, Moses has this epiphany at the burning bush, and his response is that of worship. And looking again over our Matthew 2 passage, the Magi, how did they respond to that epiphany? They talks about how that they bowed down, and they worshipped the Christ child, but they didn't, they didn't stop there. They, again, they gave the very best that they had to give. They gave their very expensive gifts of gold and, and frankincense and myrrh. Very valuable gifts. Now today, if you have a baby shower, you probably don't give gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? You're probably going to give stuff like, what, diapers and and bottles and stuff like that. I bet Mary would be like, could I get some diapers instead? <laughs> Nevertheless, they give these very expensive gifts. They give the very best they have to give. That's the point. And that really should be the point of our lives too, is that when we experience a manifestation of the divine, that we are to respond by giving God our very best all that we have. So I asked, how, how would you 
respond today? How would I respond? All of us respond today if Jesus walked through those doors right now. How would we respond? If Jesus walked in and just sat down right here, what would we do? Would we even recognize him? I don't know. But that's a hypothetical situation. The reality of it all is just what I told these children earlier. God is already here in this place. God is all around us. You see, epiphanies are still happening today. They're still happening today. More than we even imagine. It's the same thing with miracles. Sometimes, you know, we think that miracles are this, this very rare thing that, that occurs uh, every now and then. In reality, miracles are always happening. I believe what Albert Einstein said about miracles. He said either everything is a miracle or nothing is a miracle. And I believe that everything, that we are surrounded by miracles. They're, they're everywhere. And it's the same with epiphanies. God is still appearing to us today. He's still revealing himself to you and to me. And like Moses... And like the Magi, it's sometimes it's hard to recognize because sometimes it's disguised, it's veiled. But nevertheless, God appears to us. Where? How does God appear to us? Through our worship? God is in this place today. There's an epiphany taking place right here. God appears through... The music, through our prayers, God appears in the font of baptism. God appears in the table of our Lord, through the bread and through the wine. And yet they're all disguised. There's a veil, the, the, the human element, if you will. Nevertheless, God is here in this place. So, how are we going to respond to that reality? How are we going to respond? Not just during this hour, but the hours after we leave this place. How are we going to respond? Are we going to continue to bow down and worship God even after we leave this place today? Because we can have all kinds of responses to an epiphany. There was to Jesus. Not everybody was happy. Not every response was positive. In fact, Scripture tells us that King Herod, although he was saying that he wanted to find the Christ child to worship him, he was lying. That was never his intention. His response was not that of worship or giving gifts, but was murder and death. Because Herod was threatened. Threatened by this king of, this new king of the Jews. And one commentator stated that, that he longed to kill the child because of, I quote, suspicion, fear, and jealousy. To kill a child. That was Herod's response to the epiphany. So when we experience an, an, an epiphany or an appearance of God in our worship or anywhere else in our lives, do we respond with excitement? Do we respond with openness and reverence? Do we respond with, with love and, and forgiveness and joy and kindness and compassion and all of these gifts that God gives us or when we are confronted with the divine, do we respond negatively? Because we do that too. Do we ever respond with apathy? <laughs> I don't care. Or maybe disbelief? Or maybe our response is that of just coldness? 
or just some other way that simply discounts or ignores the appearance or the manifestation of God that is taking place in our very presence. How should we respond? Well, my hope and my prayer is that when any of us are made aware of the epiphanies that are happening in our lives, that his children, we would not respond with indifference. Don't respond with apathy or anger or a cold, hard heart. But respond with our greatest and most precious gifts, giving God back the best that we have to give. And just as I had said earlier during the offering, is that God is, God is blessed and God is happy when we come forth and we give, uh, we share of our time, we share of our talents, we share of our, our treasures back to God and back to the church. That, that brings God joy. But at the same time, we are more than that. We are imperfect people who struggle with things. And that's another thing that God wants us to offer up to Him. Offer up your pain. Offer up your grief, your despair, your worry. All of those things, we can respond by surrendering those things to God too. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavily burdened, and guess what? I'm going to give you rest. That's how we can respond to the epiphanies in our lives. But you know what? And that's good news and everything. And it's good to know that an epiphany is this, is this manifestation of the divine in our lives. And we know that it's, it's in our worship. We know that it's in our scripture. We know that it's in our music. We know that it's in our prayers. but it's also in your heart. The Holy Spirit, alive and well in you. And I know that sometimes God may seem to be a million miles away, but remember the Christmas promise of Emmanuel? God is with us, and God is with you. And so guess what? That makes you an epiphany. Because... The Spirit of God is alive and well within you, but it's hidden by our human frames. And so when we go forth from this place today, is God going to make an appearance through you? How will people know? Well, I'll tell you how they'll know. is when you love them unconditionally, when you forgive, when you show compassion, when you show kindness, when, you be, when you're patient with your family and your friends, all of these things, that is an appearance of the divine in your life. So we are called today to go forth and to be an epiphany to the world. God uses the body of Christ today. God uses me. God is using you. And I think of that prayer of St. Teresa one of my favorites, and she says this, Christ has no body now on earth but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the feet with which he walks forth to do good. We've experienced an epiphany here today, a manifestation of the divine, veiled behind a few words of a sermon. But even more so, we are called to go forth and be an epiphany to others through our words and through our actions. I think of that little song, This Little Light of Mine. You know that song? I'm not going to sing it for you. But it's this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.
And I conclude with this one last thought. There have been studies to show how much of a sermon, of the sermon that people remember after they leave church on Sunday. Does anybody want to take a guess what the percentage is? I had somebody say 0% in the first service. Any guesses? 25? Pretty good guess. Oh, somebody says 90. The answer is 10%. Studies have shown that people remember 10% of a sermon. I can't usually remember that much of my own sermons. But if that be the case, this is the 10% that we should remember. God lives in you. God loves you. Go forth and be an epiphany to others. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.